Over the last two years, all the streaming providers have kept themselves busy snatching down episodes of cherished comedies because they featured blackface. The catalog of condemned shows isn't short. Episodes of Saturday Night Live, 30 Rock, The Office, Community, Scrubs, and Golden Girls were either removed entirely or modified to the draw scenes that featured blackface characters. Meanwhile, Jimmy Kimmel left his position for a while when he apologized for his past use of blackface on The Man Show, the late 1990s a Comedy Central show he co-created with Adam Carolla that was intended to be unapologetically provocative. The whole joke is that Malone talks like a racist cartoon with lines like Carl Malone read on TV about white people getting deducted by aliens, sticking all kinds of hell up their butt, and that's a damn thing. Now, Carl Malone never seen no flying saucer himself, but if he do, that's going to be a spooky time. Moreover, the sad fact and honest truth of the situation is no one could ever possibly remove all of the blackface from history of American entertainment. Its roots run everywhere and show up in everything Americans think of as funny. For instance, did you know the most famous blackface performer of all time is Mickey Mouse? And the man behind the Mickey Mouse ears was known as a revolutionary, a genius, and someone who would go on to create a world of imagination forever. However, somehow we get back to color. Walter Elise Disney was born in Chicago, Illinois on December 5th, 1901, and died in Burbank, California on December 15th, 1966. Walter was a director, producer, animated, cartoonist, and screenwriter, winner of the Oscar Award 22 times, plus four honorary awards of the Academy, and the Emmy in seven opportunities. Walt Disney is known for his famous children's characters such as Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck and for founding one of the most important animations, film, and entertainment companies, Walt Disney Productions. In 1928, Disney found much success with Oswald the Rabbit but wanted to create a new character, thus begot Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse appeared for the first time in 1928 but in its beginnings it did not attract much attention. It was not until the implementation of sound that became resounding success, having the voice of Walt Disney himself. Hi there. You know, this is one of my favorite times of the day here. After 1930, there were already different movies and animations of Mickey Mouse. In 1935, all Disney short films already had sound and color image, and the rest is history. Now, Walt Disney was known to be a racist, but the proof is in the pudding. These accusations are primarily from the use of racial stereotypes in Disney movies from the 1940s. Dembo's Black Crows, Fantasia's Black Servant, Centered, and The Song of the South, a movie so offensive that the Disney company will no longer let it be seen in public. Then there is Walt Disney's own behavior. In Walt Disney by Neil Gambler, he cites a meeting in which Disney referred to the Snow White Dwarves as the nigger pile, and another in which he used the term pickaninny. The book says that Disney predicted the Song of the South controversy and attempted to make it less racist with a revision and a conference with the NAACP. The gathering never happened and the movie came out anyway. There was also some disagreement about the company's reluctance to hire minorities at Disneyland. In his book, Birth of an Industry, Blackface Minstrelsy, The Rise of American Animation, author Nicholas Salmond writes, Commercial animation in the United States didn't borrow from blackface minstrelsy, nor was it simply influenced by it. Rather, American animation is actually in many of its enduring incarnations of integral part of an ongoing iconographic and performative tradition of blackface. Mickey Mouse isn't like a minstrel, he is a minstrel. If you desire hard proof of Mickey Mouse's racist past, check out Steamboat Willie, his first popular cartoon short from 1928. Throughout, Mickey and Minnie act with the usual coonish immaturity of minstrel characters. They're even in the usual minstrel attire like them. You'll notice when Mickey relies on the boat's hook arm to grab Minnie from the shore and then unceremoniously drops her on the ship's deck, sheet music falls out of her bag. But not just any sheet music, it's a very specific song, Turkey and the Straw, the signature tune of Zip Coon, the co-founder of Blackface Minstrelsy. Even if you haven't heard of him, Zip Coon inspired the song you definitely know. A title phrase that comes directly from the chorus of Turkey in the Straw. In 1916, about a decade or so before Walt Disney's animators created Steamboat Willie, a Broadway actor named Harry C. Brown had recorded an updated version of Turkey in the Straw. Sung to the same tune, it was his first ever hit album. 
Brown, however, renamed his version Nigger Love a Watermelon, Ha Ha Ha. It's often called one of the most racist songs in the history of American music. In other words, Disney didn't pick Turkey in the Straw by accident. He knew exactly what it referred to, Backface Mistressy. There's also another early Mickey Mouse cartoon, 1929's The Haunted House, worth examining. Notice how once Mickey is locked inside the scary house after the lights go out, as he's wandering through the dark, both terrified and superstitious, he stops and only his eyes, lips, and gloved hands are visible. Mickey does a brief blackface routine as he sings, <laughs> quoting the most famous line from Mammy, the most famous blackface song in American film. Mammy. Lastly, watch Mickey's Melodrama. It's a short from 1933 that features Mickey and Minnie performing their version of Uncle Tom's Cabin with a whole cast of cartoon animals in blackface. Rather than burnt cork, Mickey uses an exploded firework to apply an unmistakable fresh coat of comical blackness. It's surreal to see Mickey's slave master threaten him, bow down to your master, I own your body and soul, and the plucky mouse in blackface responding, now let's be real. Mickey Mouse or Disney isn't going to be canceled on account of his or their menstrual past. But that also doesn't mean that we should ignore the fact that the beloved cartoon mouse is a continuation of a racist American tradition that demeaned black people to make a fast buck. If anything, I'd argue that calling the attention to Mickey Mouse and blackface is a good way to discuss systematic racism. Removing offensive material should never be the no-brainer choice. We need to think about things. To do so, we need to keep the receipts. Because when you erase the evidence of racism, it starts to feel more like covering up a crime than a heartfelt apology. Besides, Mickey Mouse is his past just as much as he is his future. This is equally true of America. In that way, racist Mickey Mouse is a good measure of how far we've come. But only if we're honest about our ugly past first.